Now that's an extraordinary talk. That's an extraordinary talk. That's the kind of talk that you would expect from an ANC cabinet member trying to G up support for next year's election. And yet here you've got the opposition. Why are your political opponents not making these kind of presentations? And why are you? One of the great disappointments I had on reaching Parliament was to find out that the ANC don't read. They literally don't. No articles, no books, no papers. They sit there and they come to a committee meeting and they look what's on the screen, what's been presented by the department and they ask questions. Usually it's questions about how many bursaries are you giving and how many women do you have in management. So they don't really know what's going on. That's the primary reason. Um, I do, I, I am quite hopeful that they have learned their lesson from that bungled attempt to change the oil and gas legislation 10 years ago. Because when that happened, the oil majors just folded their arms. Exxon used to be big in South Africa. They said, well, we're not investing a dollar under these conditions. Not one. And everybody sat there for a couple of years. And I think that's when it dawned on the ANC that maybe they didn't have the whip hand in this and they would have to compromise and be a bit more realistic. And I think that process is ongoing. Because there's a lot of this resource nationalism in the ANC that says that, you know, we've got the resource and everybody else can only exploit it under our own conditions. And that's just not the case. There is there are a lot of minerals and a lot of oil and gas around the world. So we've got to compete with our other jurisdictions. Um, I think that message may be sinking in. We'll see in the next few weeks if that uh, legislation gets processed more or less in the way that it, that it looks. I mean, we are going to oppose the legislation because it has racial set-asides. But despite that, I think that it looks like it may be something the oil and gas companies can live with. And if that's the case, they'll be in here. How, how much money is it, is, it going to, is going to be needed? Now, you know, you spoke earlier about the diamond rush, and then you mentioned the gold rush. And these, are, these were world-famous events. Entrepreneurs from all over the world came to this country and turned felt into a prize for the British uh, Empire, and if you consider what happened in, in gold and diamonds, in fact. Mm. How, uh, but yet it was, there was a heck of a lot of international capital that was needed to exploit this res resource. How much are we talking about here? I can't give you a figure. Uh, what, is, what is important about this, though, is that it is the oil super majors that are interested. So when you're talking about Shell and you're talking about Tatal, you're talking about people with the pockets that are deep enough to, to be able to afford these things. Most of their acreages up and down the coast with us and Namibia are in consortia. So you will find that there are South African companies. HCI, for example, is one of them that is involved with these, these super majors. So you can expect money and expertise, a lot of it, to come from outside. Once they're interested, then you know you're going to get the money. Let's just start, if we can, off the West Coast. So you, you've given a very compelling argument about what's going on in Namibia. How similar is the geology all the way down? I knew you were going to ask me a geology question. <laughs> Apparently, very similar. Apparently, it's the same. It's the Orange Basin, and they are, what's the word, stoked about the geology. They say they've proven it in Namibia, and the same features go all the way down the coast. So, you know, as I said, never trust a geologist. Um, but these ones I think you can trust because they're talking about expending huge amounts of money. And the stat that you said about most oil exploration is you get a 1 in 10 hit rate, and yet here it's 100%. That's, that's extraordinary. That is extraordinary. That's why people are jumping up and down about Namibia, and they really are. I mean, there's two jurisdictions in the world that are exciting to the oil majors at the moment. One is Namibia, the other one is Guyana of South America. And uh, they're very excited about Namibia. So that side of the country is very underdeveloped at the moment. Would the development of an oil field, oil and gas field there, have an impact onshore? Definitely to some extent, because uh, when you're running an oil uh, drilling operation, there's a lot of logistics involved. 
So, you know, you need to keep them supplied with um, engineering. You need to keep them supplied with uh, food and, and uh, you need a place for your crews to stay. Um, so there's quite a lot of that. Um, then if the question is, are they going to pipe the gas on shore? Which seems they might be doing. And when it's on shore, are they going to then set up facilities there to convert it into a form that they can take it overseas in tankers? Or are we going to have it available to us to turn into electricity or for any other industrial use? I suspect electricity in that part of the world, because there's so little development, is the most likely uh, outcome. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, uh, really, I, I'd probably, if I had the money, I'd probably be buying land in, in, in Port Nolos at the moment, because I think that's maybe a good bet. As a starting point, if you just go way over to the other side of the continent in Mozambique and Total's fine there of the big gas field there, are there any parallels of what's happened there apart from uh, the military issues um, to what could happen on the west coast of South Africa? I don't know. I mean, the, the Mozambique one seems to be more gas and this one is oil and gas. And as uh, one of the, the guys from the super major said to me some time ago, he said, everybody's really interested in oil. They like gas, but oil is where the real money is. So that's a good thing. It's better than Mozambique in that sense. Why now? Why has this, because it's obviously been there for ever. Why are we only discovering it now? I think part of it is the technology. Um, these things are, you know, when you're talking about 180, 200 kilometers offshore in two kilometers of water before you even hit the rock, and then you're another kilometer, kilometer and a half down underneath that, it's an incredible undertaking. And they haven't had the technology to do that forever. Um, just as an additional point here, the, the Brulpada and Leipert are even more difficult because they, they sit in the Mozambique current. So you've got all that, and then you've got a sort of, a, I think it's about a five knot current as well that you need to, to cope with. So it, uh, there's only a couple of oil wells apparently in the world, which are uh, drilling rigs, that you, which are able to cope with those kind of conditions. So it's very difficult. Okay, so the West is looking good. We've got Namibia. They, they, uh, and just, just by context, we know Norway is probably the richest country in the world. When you say that the receipts by the Namibian government could be or are likely to be at the same scale as Norway. What does it mean for the Namibian people? Should we all be getting Namibian citizenship? <laughs> Possibly. Um, they're going to have a lot of money for development. And as long as they can um, keep government's hands off it, because as we all know, the sad story of oil states is often that they, the, the resource gets stolen. Um, then things will go very well there, I, I suspect. Um, so far, again, uh, this is from a source in one of the oil majors, said the Namibian government cannot do enough for us. So they seem to be being very sensible about it at the moment. It's hope that it continues. It was quite interesting at the last uh, Davos event, not the most recent one, the one the year before, Namibia had a huge stand there, the Namibian government, telling its story to the rest of the world. So they're definitely on the front foot. By comparison, we had pretty much nothing from South Africa. We're getting a bit better, but there is an understanding of the asset that they own, unquestionably, from the way they're marketing it globally. So the West Coast looks real good. Uh, the, the Cape Independence Party or the independent protagonists, I know your uh, political party is against Cape Independence because you want to save all of South Africa. Would this not play into their hands, though? I don't think it should necessarily. In fact, it probably argues against it because there's no way an ANC government would let go of the Western Cape if it knew it had oil and gas. No, I mean, for real. Why so, would you? Yeah. 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 Okay, let's uh, come to this part of the world. Um, the other side of Cape Town, going up towards Brilpada, Mossel Bay, that area. Give us some, just, just unpack a little more what the development opportunities are. Okay, um... So they're talking about a billion barrels of oil and I think it's three to four trillion cubic feet of gas. Again, quite far offshore. And the interesting thing about that is at its closest point, uh, I think those wells are about 64 kilometers away from the old gas infrastructure from the Moss Gas Project. So it would make it cheaper and quicker simply to connect that up and then you could feed that gas back on short Mossel Bay. Now, 
there is some enthusiasm for uh, turning that gas to liquids plant from moss gas back on, but it's a very old plant and it hasn't had anything put through it for, I think it's three years. It's very expensive to maintain, but like any piece of complicated machinery, it might be that uh, that's not really a prospect and it would be more intelligent to push that gas to the Hurikwa, um, I think it is the Hurikwa, yes, thank you, um, peaking plant, and maybe expand that and produce electricity there. Would it have any impact on the town? Cape Town has already benefited from using its docks to repair oil rigs. I'm sure most people have seen a couple of years ago, they had a couple of huge projects which employed thousands and thousands of engineers and a great benefit for the local economy. So no sort of direct money from the oil and gas, but the, the spin-off in, in keeping those industries supplied is huge, very positive. Okay, moving a bit further up the coast, there was a there were quite a few strikes off the east coast, KZN, that area, and then the guys ran away. Not strikes, but um, prospects. There was, there was prospects. There was exploration, um, uh, but uh, they, they they were taken to court time and again. And although they're confident that in the end they're pretty sure they're going to win, it just delays everything. So, and you know, when you've got big capital to spend, you don't want to keep it sitting around waiting for a court to decide something. You send it somewhere else in the world. And that's always the risk that we face uh, if these delays are imposed on us. Going further up the coast then, the issue appears to be what you're saying now, the, the green lobby. Tell us a bit more about big green or those who are obstructive of development for developing countries. I must just say at this point that uh, this is a a much discussed um, issue even in my own party and I'm not uh, speaking for the party on this I'm very much speaking for myself on the issue of of big green Um, but I do think that it is it is a threat and it is not beneficial Um, I come from a conservation background I mean when I was a kid I was steeped in this stuff my father was a conservationist he stopped coal mining in the Kruger Park in the 1970s because he was also a politician. Um, so yeah, um, all of a sudden when the Berlin Wall came down, all the reds became greens and, uh, and they're with us. And I, t- I have an extremely skeptical view of many of them who I don't think are particularly interested in the environment. I think they're more interested in changing socioeconomic relations. And how do we, the people, combat that? Just say no. <laughs> that, you know, the Greens get a lot of sympathy because they've managed to look like the good guys all the time. Um, they, everybody accepts that oh, these guys, you know, they're just doing it to try and save the planet. Um, but like any other industry, um, like any, any belief system, there's a vested interest there. And there are huge vested interests in Greens and in NGOs. I mean, I've worked for a media NGO and I know that the fiercest battles that we fought were for more funding. And many NGOs are self-perpetuation. Self-perpetuation is their primary goal, not what they say it is. They want to continue to be an organization that is well-funded and drive sexy Land Rovers around exotic destinations. That's, but that's what it is. So yeah, don't, don't take them at face value. Investigate them just the same as you're skeptical of oil companies, which you should be. Be skeptical of the Greens too. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the, 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 the big story, the Rob Hershoff story. I know he's gone off now to his appointment, but the Karoo. The first information that came out from the uh, International Energy Association was that we had the fourth biggest fracking resources in the world. And this is going back over a decade. They used quite a lot of the information that the old Sukho, uh, the, the wells that were drilled in those days, and Sukho was looking for oil. So when they found the gas, they discarded it. And I hear stories of some of these wells that, that burnt for days with the gas, and Sukho wasn't really interested. So it appears that there is 
a lot of shale gas there. But the, the, the argument has always been with the environmental lobby. Just explain to us how that has taken so long to even get to a point where there might be drilling going into the future, and then secondly, what the future could be. Government has put quite a lot of effort into not annoying the environmentalists over over fracking. Uh, they've taken it, they've taken the objections quite seriously, um, and the Council for Geoscience has done these projects. And there've been not only the Council for Geoscience, but sort of multi dis, multi agency uh, investigations have been involved in all this. And they so they've drawn up a report, incidentally, which is sitting with with Guido Montasche. Um, he is uh, deciding whether or not to share it with the public. Um, so I don't know how that'll go. Um, and, and, and then it'll be, um, then they'll start drawing up um, regulations, apparently. And as I say, you know, in the United States, they have drilling standards. And I imagine that we will end up with standards like those. And if so, you can be fairly sure that there is no major environmental threat. There are other problems, uh, one of them being the availability of water, because, of course, you need that for fracking. Um, and uh, then what you do with the water once it comes out again, because to frack you need to push the water down the well and then you it gets spat back out basically and it has all sorts of underground nasties in it, so you need to clean it. Um, but really my, my attitude on this is if there is money to be made down there, they can afford to bring in their own water. So whether it's piping it from the orange system or somewhere else, or even taking um, deep underground brackish water which there is in fairly large quantities. It's not all brackish. I mean, when the uh, Council for Geoscience was drilling these test boreholes around Beaufort West, they, they struck one or two very good water sources, which they then were able to provide to the town, which is perennially short of, of drinking water. So, yeah, look, I mean, any problem like that is solvable. The only question is, how much is it going to cost? And, you know, my, uh, my attitude to the environmental stuff is just, you know, don't mess it up. If you're going to do something, make sure that it is sustainable. And then when, when you're finished extracting what you're extracting, you leave as tiny a footprint as possible. You certainly, it certainly doesn't make sense to destroy water sources or farmland or anything like that. So as long as you're not doing that and it still makes financial sense, then go for it. James, the, the Western Cape is held up now as a template of good governance. Is there enough power devolved to the Western Cape that they could go it alone on something like this if they were feet dragging at central government? I don't think so. Uh, this is a, a central government function, uh, oil and gas, minerals. So would you as the DA be given that you are strongly propagating devolution of power, put this on your checklist as well, along with police and transport and other issues that you'd like to have more control over? Well, to be a bit cynical about it, if we controlled national government, we wouldn't really feel the need so strongly to devolve something like oil and gas to a province. I mean, in general, we're a, we believe in federalism. So it's quite possible that we would increase uh, the powers granted to provinces, uh, which is a double-edged sword. I mean, everybody then wants to live in the Western Cape with lots of powers. Nobody wants to live in Northwest with lots of powers. You can imagine what would happen there. It, it, it just, it almost sounds too good to be true all of this and especially coming from someone who hasn't got an agenda to make the country look brighter right now in fact you your agenda has to presumably has to be yeah after 2024 it's going to look brighter so help us understand this and and why why are you telling the story of hope well it's there um and it's we should all know you know the the, the main thing about a democracy that works is everybody knows what's at stake. Um, so it's partly that, partly just because it interests the hell out of me. Um, and I suppose also because people need hope at the moment. Everybody's very gloomy. I mean, today, accepted, we've heard some good stuff. Um, yeah, we need some good news. And this is incredibly good news. It's probably the first good news story I think I've ever told, but it's been great fun. Okay, Sean Pesh, there we go, value. I mean, the best value you've got is property in North, in Port Nolith, uh, property in Mossel Bay and, and Beaufort West. It's got to be cheap. <laughs>